starting at the beginning, who initially is an agency worker? Well, they're an individual that's usually engaged via an agency, and they're going to be providing services to what we call the host business, um, where they'll be providing specific jobs. Um, who exactly that might be in the construction sector can vary dramatically. We might see some bricklayers or builders or tradespeople such as electricians and plumbers. Um, once upon a time, it was always questioned as, whether, as to whether agency workers were actually a group of workers of their own right. And it is now clear that, or has been clear for some time, in fact, that there is a distinguishable group of agency workers as opposed to falling under the heading of employees. So how are agency workers engaged? And when I'm using the term employer here, I'm using the term employer as the employer of the agency worker. So they're engaged by an employment contract with the agency. And the commercial relationship is then between the agency and the host business. And as Jonathan kindly fed into this talk, it is important to get those terms right between the agency and the host company. That's because that's our first step to begin vetting the agency workers that might be coming onto our site and reducing the risk of those difficulties that uh, Jonathan's described, not least the substantial fines that he's mentioned. Looking back at what rights agency workers have, so as I've said, they're employed by the agency itself, and their contract with the agency will detail their employment rights. Those are things such as minimum wage. They're also still required to work in line with the working time regulations. They're not actually usually entitled to things like minimum notice, uh, so minimum notice periods, and they don't, they don't have the same protection from unfair dismissal claims. They do have the same rights as their permanent colleagues, however. So if agency workers are coming on site and the host business might have benefits such as a subsidized canteen or site-to-site -site travel or a car park, then those agency workers have the right to benefit from those benefits in the same way as permanent colleagues on site. Those rights do however change at the 12 week period. So up until 12 weeks, their rights are as a worker and their rights remain in that way just with some additions from the 12 week period. They begin to become entitled to equal pay. So that's the same pay that a, a permanent colleague doing the same job would benefit from. They also might be automatically enrolled into a pension or should at least be entitled to be, and they should be paid annual leave. So how do we count that 12 week period? Well, the starting point is fairly clear. We start with day one, and that's day one of engagement with the host business to which they're providing their specific services. It doesn't then have to be a consecutive period of 12 weeks, and there are periods during that time which can stop and start the counting process. So for example, a break of less than six weeks won't be counted, sick leave for up to 28 weeks also won't be counted, and any annual leave won't be taken into account when counting this 12 week period. However, any absence for pregnancy or the 26 weeks following the birth of a child, adoption or paternity leave will be counted. Furthermore, the 12 week period can start again. So if there is a break, for example, if an agency worker is engaged at a particular site for a particular host business and, and there is a break of over six weeks, they come back and the 12 week period will start again. However, the agency worker regulations do question how many times that can happen and whether there is a intention to prevent an agency worker from, um, from benefiting from those rights that, are enti that they're entitled to after the 12 week period. Now, Jonathan touched upon this in a fair amount of detail at the end of his presentation. And the two headlines are qualifications and training. So as we were saying, we want the right people on site to do the job. And from a health and safety perspective, that's particularly important. I think that Jonathan had given some interesting stats, one of which was that 28% of deaths in the sectors are in the construction sector. And there are lots of benefits from engaging agency workers, but we want to make sure that any agency worker we do engage is the right individual for the job. So how can we reduce those risks? As I've mentioned, one of the starting points is that the relationship between the host and the agency will be governed by a set of commercial terms and that's something which my commercial colleagues would be more experienced to advise upon. Nonetheless, it's something I'm still recognizing. Jonathan was also mentioning vetting by the agency and or the host as required. 
So one of the starting points could be that those commercial terms which govern the relationship between the host and the agency have sufficient provisions dealing with the qualifications and training, including continuing training and qualifications that are required when engaging agency workers. So why use agency workers? Yes, there are risks. Engaging them is also beneficial. It provides the host business with much greater flexibility than if an employee was engaged. If we look at the current situation and the impact of COVID-19, an agency worker wouldn't have had the same right to redundancy and redundancy pay, nor to participate in a furlough scheme. They are usually engaged for much shorter periods of time and the responsibilities of the host are significantly reduced as are the liabilities. That's not to say that they are not in existence entirely because they are certainly something that a host business should be aware of. However, the engagement of agency workers, if the terms between an agency and the host business are sufficient and providing sufficient protection, certainly has its benefits.